The Brothers Karamazov Novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky Originally published in 1880 This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 2 He Gets Rid of His Eldest Son You can easily imagine what a father such a man could be and how he would bring up his children. His behavior as a father was exactly what might be expected. He completely abandoned the child of his marriage with Adelaida Ivanovna, not from malice, nor because of his matrimonial grievances, but simply because he forgot him. While he was wearying everyone with his tears and complaints, and turning his house into a sink of debauchery, a faithful servant of the family, Grigory, took the three-year-old Mitya into his care. If he hadn't looked after him, there would have been no one even to change the baby's little shirt. It happened moreover that the child's relations on his mother's side forgot him too at first. His grandfather was no longer living, his widow, Mitya's grandmother, had moved to Moscow and was seriously ill, while his daughters were married. So that Mitya remained for almost a whole year in old Grigory's charge and lived with him in the servant's cottage. But if his father had remembered him, he could not, indeed, have been altogether unaware of his existence, he would have sent him back to the cottage as the child would only have been in the way of his debaucheries. But a cousin of Mitya's mother, Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, happened to return from Paris. He lived for many years afterwards abroad, but was at that time quite a young man, and distinguished among the Myasovs as a man of enlightened ideas and of European culture, who had been in the capitals and abroad. Towards the end of his life, he became a liberal of the type common in the 40s and 50s. In the course of his career, he had come into contact with many of the most liberal men of his epoch, both in Russia and abroad. He had known Proudhon and Bakunin personally, and in his declining years was very fond of describing the three days of the Paris Revolution of February 1848, hinting that he himself had almost taken part in the fighting on the barricades. This was one of the most grateful recollections of his youth. He had an independent property of about a thousand souls to reckon in the old style. His splendid estate lay on the outskirts of our little town and bordered on the lands of our famous monastery, with which Pyotr Alexandrovich began an endless lawsuit. Almost as soon as he came into the estate, concerning the rights of fishing in the river or woodcutting in the forest, I don't know exactly which. He regarded it as his duty as a citizen and a man of culture to open an attack upon the clericals. Hearing all about Adelaida Ivanovna, whom he, of course, remembered, and in whom he had at one time been interested, in learning of the existence of Mitya, he intervened, in spite of all his youthful indignation and contempt for Fyodor Pavlovich. He made the latter's acquaintance for the first time, and told him directly that he wished to undertake the child's education. He used long afterwards to tell as a characteristic touch, that when he began to speak of Mitya, Fyodor Pavlovich looked for some time as though he did not understand what child he was talking about and even as though he was surprised to hear that he had a little son in the house. The story may have been exaggerated, yet it must have been something like the truth. Fyodor Pavlovich was all his life fond of acting, of suddenly playing an unexpected part, sometimes without any motive for doing so, and even to his own direct disadvantage, as for instance. In the present case, this habit, however, is characteristic of a very great number of people, some of them very clever ones, not like Fyodor Pavlovich. Pyotr Alexandrovich carried the business through vigorously and was appointed, with Fyodor Pavlovich, joint guardian of the child, who had a small property, a house and land. Left him by his mother. Mitya did, in fact, pass into this cousin's keeping, but as the latter had no family of his own, and after securing the revenues of his estates was in haste to return at once to Paris. He left the boy in charge of one of his cousins, a lady living in Moscow. It came to pass that, settling permanently in Paris, he, too, forgot the child, especially when the revolution of February broke out, making an impression on his mind that he remembered all the rest of his life. The Moscow lady died, and Mitya passed into the care of one of her married daughters. I believe he changed his home a fourth time later on. I won't enlarge upon that now as I shall have much to tell later of Fyodor Pavlovich's firstborn, and must confine myself now to the most essential facts about him, without which I could not begin my story. In the first place, this Mitya, or rather Dmitri Fyodorovich, was the only one of Fyodor Pavlovich's three sons who grew up in the belief that he had property. 
and that he would be independent on coming of age. He spent an irregular boyhood and youth. He did not finish his studies at the gymnasium, he got into a military school, then went to the Caucasus, was promoted, fought a duel, and was degraded to the ranks, earned promotion again. Led a wild life, and spent a good deal of money. He did not begin to receive any income from Fyodor Pavlovich until he came of age, and until then got into debt. He saw and knew his father, Fyodor Pavlovich, for the first time on coming of age, when he visited our neighborhood on purpose to settle with him about his property. He seems not to have liked his father. He did not stay long with him, and made haste to get away, having only succeeded in obtaining a sum of money, and entering into an agreement for future payments from the estate. Of the revenues and value of which he was unable, a fact worthy of note, upon this occasion, to get a statement from his father. Fyodor Pavlovich remarked for the first time then, this, too, should be noted, that Mitya had a vague and exaggerated idea of his property. Fyodor Pavlovich was very well satisfied with this, as it fell in with his own designs. He gathered only that the young man was frivolous, unruly, of violent passions, impatient, and dissipated, and that if he could only obtain ready money he would be satisfied, although only, of course, for a short time. So Fyodor Pavlovich began to take advantage of this fact, sending him from time to time small doles, installments. In the end, when four years later, Mitya, losing patience, came a second time to our little town to settle up once for all with his father, it turned out to his amazement that he had nothing. That it was difficult to get an account even, that he had received the whole value of his property and sums of money from Fyodor Pavlovich, and was perhaps even in debt to him. That by various agreements into which he had, of his own desire, entered at various previous dates, he had no right to expect anything more, and so on, and so on. The young man was overwhelmed, suspected deceit and cheating, and was almost beside himself. And, indeed, this circumstance led to the catastrophe, the account of which forms the subject of my first introductory story, or rather the external side of it. But before I pass to that story, I must say a little of Fyodor Pavlovich's other two sons, and of their origin. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button, and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.